It's been over 12 months since I last slept in my bed. I was actually looking forward to it. Because of the severe ocean storm that was coming our way, I had ordered a complete shutdown of all oil rigs pumping oil. It was a big decision, but one that had to be made. Based on the latest reports from the meteorologists, I would not risk further drilling in this new area until the weather cleared. This was the sixth well I had drilled in this area in a row, and I didn't want any major problems to cause us to be six months behind and lose millions in the process. The impending bad weather was slow moving and seemed to rotate, increasing in size and strength, leaving massive destruction in its wake. Those in authority thought we were in for a direct hit, but said it was up to me to decide. This was typical of the big shots who sat in their offices in their blue suits. If it was done wrong, I was to blame. And if I called it right, they would take all the credit. Each of the five oil rigs in the area was 20 nautical miles apart in a horizontal row. Because of the rocks underneath the top of the seafloor, we drilled again at a 45 degree angle to get to the oil and natural gas underneath. We spent the last 220 hours pulling up our drills and closing all the pipelines near the bottom. This required precise synchronization from our team of deep sea divers. Plugging the wells at seabed level had to be done manually and took about an hour. The key was to keep as much salt water from entering the well as possible. Fortunately, everything went quite smoothly. The flow of oil to the production units was blocked off at the seabed in case a passing hurricane damaged our onshore facilities. All oil collected was reloaded onto tankers for safe transportation to the mainland. All pipelines were tightened, sealed at both ends, and blocked off. This was to ensure that none of the pipes would sink to the bottom if they broke. We learned from BP's mistakes that you can't make mistakes. We needed those sections of pipe to stay afloat. A helicopter transported the remaining few of us back to the coast. According to company policy, we had to and wanted to leave as small an environmental footprint as possible. Under my leadership, I vowed that we would never encounter a situation like BP's. And I was not scheduled to be let go for another two months, so I knew my arrival home would be a complete surprise. I was looking forward to seeing my wife, children, and neighbors with whom we had become good friends. The nice thing about my position with the company was that I received a base salary year-round even if I stayed home, but the main money I made was when I worked on the oil rigs. This has paid off big time over the last three years. I was on the rigs practically 85% of the time, which tripled my base pay before overtime, which for me was about 32 hours a week. It was customary on the rigs to work 12-hour shifts. When we drilled, we only stopped when I was exhausted. People with my experience and knowledge of angle drilling were considered hard to find, and were paid accordingly. So far, I had a perfect track record and had not lost a single drilling site. Thanks to the booming economy in the United States, drilling for oil was at its busiest. As a result, I was being paid top dollar because they couldn't find anyone to replace me. The market for people with my skills was so narrow. When I got my last promotion more than five years ago, I decided I wanted to retire early. So, with the assistance of human resources, my paycheck was split three ways when I worked on the rigs. 4O always got the maximum from day one. 25% was automatically transferred to my investment broker, and the rest went directly into my wife and I's bank account. What was coming into our joint account was amazing. For the past five years, I was secure, because of how well the stock market and the economy were doing. My wife and I agreed years ago that once our joint account reached a certain level, we would start making huge mortgage payments. We would divide any surplus after it was paid off once a month and put it into separate savings accounts. As a result, in 20 years of marriage, I had already emptied my savings account four times when it reached the maximum federally insured amount and turned it over to my investment manager. My investment broker was instructed to divide my investments into three parts. One third went into company stocks, the second third into technology stocks like Google, Amazon, and Facebook. The final third went into blue chip dividend paying stocks. 
Investor reports were sent to me directly to the company's email account. Since I was often at sea during tax time, my wife and I always filed separately, with her taking deductions for our children. If we were hit by a level 3 hurricane or higher, no one could get back on the rigs until they were all 100% inspected. I was committed to these details because I didn't want to jeopardize the lives of the people working with me. A team would be sent to the bottom of the bay to survey it before making the connection. Regardless, it looked like I was getting at least two months off. Most people didn't realize that the harder the ocean swings at the surface, the harder the water flow hits the shoreline. The backward flow, depending on the strength, could cause a backward ripple on the surface of the seafloor that continued until it disappeared into nothingness. Given the slow movement of the hurricane, the longer it lingered over our areas, the more costly it would be to rebuild. So I kept an eye on the weather over the next few days to get an idea of how long I would be gone. I was part of the advisory group that oversaw the birth of these new procedures after they cost our parent company BP billions of dollars because they refused to follow our suggestions before the last disaster. A few million dollars lost today saved us from billions lost in litigation and government contrived crap. These days, letting someone in government rake in your money was an open invitation to be screwed over without even a kiss. BP saw firsthand the real costs when democratically elected governments treated those accused of pollution like their pimps. The corporation was charged with many dubious invoices whose direct link to the problems caused by BP could not be proven. Many in the industry felt that governments were taking advantage of the situation to solve problems that they themselves had created. And most in the oil industry have learned from this big mistake and have now budgeted for at least one long-term shutdown of some sort. They had adopted a policy of protecting their own ass at all costs. In many ways, BP was still recovering. Shanna and I met our neighbors Jack and Jasmine Parsons shortly after we bought our current home. At the time, she was three months pregnant with our first child, who turned out to be a boy. Hunter Allen Phillips was born weighing seven pounds. Sarah Louise was born less than four years later. The house was too big for us, but we grew up in it. Both of our children were almost out of their teens. Hunter had just turned 20, and Sarah was counting the days until she could get rid of her students. Jack and Jasmine, who had just gotten married when we met them, couldn't have children for reasons that were never revealed. Over the years, they became foster aunts and uncles to our children and our best friends. Jack was a little older than us, and Jasmine was nine years younger. In my eyes, Jasmine was one of the most beautiful African-American women I had ever met. If any woman could convince me to back out of my marriage vows, it was her. I could never see in Jack what she saw. Jack is just a good old boy with no class, the morals of an idiot, and a constant liar. But apparently he knew how to sell like no one I knew. I was sitting in the Tampa airport waiting for my next flight to St. Louis and reading Wednesday's local paper when a text message arrived. It read, Dad, when you get a chance, give me a call. It was from my daughter Sarah. I wondered for a moment if she had changed much in the last 14 months since I had been home. For hard-working oil men like me, family always paid the highest price for not being around, so I was seriously considering finding something else to do for the rest of my life. I called her right away. Hi, Dad, she said. Thanks for calling so quickly. What's up, Buttercup? I replied. I nicknamed her Buttercup because when she was little, she and I used to spend a lot of afternoons picking up so many of them to fill a small cup for her mother. It meant a lot to the two of us but her mother would thank her and forget about it. I kept them in the water and took the dead ones out daily until it was time to do it again. I don't know where to start, Dad, Sarah admitted honestly. How about the bare facts, I said, deciding it wasn't serious. Okay, let's get started, she said. Hunter's in the hospital. They're operating on him. They're repairing his shoulder from a bullet that went through. Uncle Jack is in jail on attempted murder charges. Aunt Jasmine finally gave birth and is three months pregnant. Are you kidding? I said. That sounds unbelievable. Well, you said you wanted the bare facts, Sarah said. Those are what I've provided you with. 
The rest I feel I need to explain to you before you talk to your mom. What makes you think that, Buttercup? I asked seriously. The whole situation is complicated, and it's not as simple as it seems, Sarah said without going into detail. You've always taught us that there are always two sides to a story, and that we need to find out what the facts really are before deciding what to believe. Sarah said it well. I've said many times over the years that I've heard your side of the story from your point of view, and now I need to find out what the facts are before I make any decisions. Mom will tell you what she wants you to hear and possibly believe, Sarah said. To do that, she'll leave out some facts she doesn't want you to ever know. The situation with my brother, aunt and uncle, is also related to her. Okay, Buttercup, I'll get on a plane to St. Louis now and take the first flight back to the Cape in the morning, I said. Skip school tomorrow, and when you arrive, I'll catch a cab home. Your mom will have left for work by then. You're coming home, that's great. Mom's in New York, Sarah said. Macy's has gathered all the store managers in the area at headquarters for a big meeting to increase sales and reduce overall inventory levels in an effort to cut operating costs. This region is still one of the few that is generating good profits. Senior management is trying to figure out what they're doing differently that makes this area successful. Has she been informed of this? I asked. No, I'm still in the hospital waiting to hear from the doctor. Sarah explained. I'm calling you because I figured you should be the first to know. I really didn't want to get her involved until we talked. No, no, no. Let someone in accounting know I'll be there with our medical records first thing in the morning, I said. Thanks, Buttercup, for texting me. Love you. See you in the morning. Saying goodbye, I got ready to go through security and head to the waiting area. It gave me time to think about the four of us and our relationship with each other over the years. All of our married life I had worked on the rigs, starting as a loader and working my way up through the ranks. Out of boredom while at sea, I got serious and tried to get every degree possible in my chosen field. This began the journey to what I do today. I remembered the day I met Shauna. She had stopped at Walmart to buy a few things and was driving too fast. She didn't notice the black ice failed to slow down, and crashed into the piece of junk I was driving at the time. She got out of the car all excited and scared because she was driving her dad's car. Her bumper was intact, and as for my little truck, one or two scratches didn't make a difference. After parking the car, we went into the Subway restaurant inside Wally World, and she bought me a six-inch sub and a coffee for being a good sport. Shauna, taking off her winter coat, caught my eye. She was tight with all the curves most men want. She was one of the few women I could easily spend hours with, not just because she looked good, but because her personality shone brightly. Admittedly, she was the one who made me think seriously about life. Before that, I was just a good old boy enjoying life and taking advantage of all the opportunities women gave me. I loved to party, be with the crowd, and would come back to the rig ready to sober up and get clean. Shauna, when I first saw her, realized she wanted to do something with her life. That first weekend we spent together gave me purpose and direction. During that same month, I went back to school to better myself. The more we interacted with each other, the more determined I became. I think she had the same impression of me because her parents often said she was a better person because of me. Eight months later we got engaged. Six months later we were married. Soon after that, I started working offshore on big rigs because the bosses noticed a big change in everything I did. I have Shauna to thank for that. I started earning what was then considered big money. At the time, I didn't know yet what an addiction that paycheck would become. Looking back on that time, I think we forced each other to grow up and be adults. As we went through life, I never regretted a thing. Shauna earned a business college degree and began her career as a manager of the women's apparel department at Macy's, earning a base salary and commission. Retail merchandising was an art to her that few people knew or understood. She excelled at it, and every couple years she had to work in a new department. After she was well established in each department, she was offered the position of junior manager. When the position of manager of the smallest store became available, 
she was asked to take it until someone suitable was found. Little did anyone know that through the training and coaching she did with the staff, the store's sales and reputation would grow. One day, a department manager came in to see her and said, the store manager position is yours. Three years ago, she finally got the store manager position at Cape. It was her third move since becoming store manager. Plus, it was the biggest one yet. It was nice because now she worked 10 miles from home. While she was putting her stamp on it, its sales started to pick up, and it became one of the fastest growing stores in terms of sales in the division. Jack Parsons was an independent wholesaler who made his living by driving his routes and selling the tools his suppliers supplied him. His customers were regular Joes who made a living repairing cars. I didn't know how much he made, but I knew from the way he spent it that he didn't have to suffer. I just didn't understand why our neighborhood wasn't among those he covered as part of his territory. Jack knew everyone and had a knack for getting things when others couldn't and always came home with unexpected expensive gifts for his loving wife. He was a mystery to me because he seemed simple and carefree. Another thing I found challenging was that he always paid for everything in cash. He didn't like to use credit or debit cards. The only bank account they had was in the name of his better half. Jasmine had worked at the Southeast Missourian newspaper for many years and was not only a staff reporter, but had worked her way up to assistant editor. She was a highly respected person in the community and served on several boards of directors. Her giving and love made her a star in our community. If you looked at us together, you would wonder how we could have been friends. Jasmine and Jack were African-American. Shauna and I are six generations Anglo-American. When the kids were small, whenever we needed time to ourselves, Jasmine would spoil our children. When they walked with her, Jack, if asked, would always reply that we had adopted them. He enjoyed it because so many people fell for his bullshit. He enjoyed it even more when they started calling him Uncle Jack. Our kids growing up were spoiled by them. I felt my family was blessed by their presence in our lives. So, for most of my flight, I was trying to figure out what was going on and what this was all about. All four of us had busy lives, so none of what we heard made sense to me. However, Sarah made it clear that the relationship between us was what tied everything together. I was facing a three-hour wait in St. Louis until I could catch my connecting flight home. If you're familiar with the airport in St. Louis, you know how stupid it is. A few years ago, they closed the indoor smoking areas just to annoy smokers. The restaurants open at that time of day were just disgusting. If you wanted to smoke, you had to walk out of the airport and back in going through security again. And there were people sitting right in front of you who were smoking. Now they were saying that it wasn't the tar and nicotine that caused cancer. It was the smoke itself lingering in the air that was causing the problem. The one thing they never talked about was that it was all about our genetics. It was our DNA that caused the problem, not what we were actually doing. I knew that with the problems some were having from buying illegal foods containing lung-damaging oils, it wouldn't be long before the medical community started pushing for those who cook with pure or synthetic oil to start using masks to cover their nose and mouth while cooking because of the danger of inhaling oil into their lungs. It seemed it only took a few idiots for the media to start considering this extreme. I stood outside the airport, finally giving in to one of the pleasures I had in my life. Yes, I was smoking a full-flavored Marlboro cigarette. One of the perks of working on offshore deepwater rigs was that the boxes they delivered to a small retail store didn't have all the taxes due on them. The average price for a box of my favorite cigarettes was less than 20 bucks. On this last trip home, I took six boxes with me. One of the rules I made was no alcoholic beverages on the rigs. The men were against it, but their wives sent thank you letters because of the money saved. It also made it much easier to accomplish the goals I had set. For the men's wives, I walked on water. For those who were shorter than me, I was what came out of a horse's ass. One of the joys of American life is that we had to pay large hidden taxes so our political representatives could spend millions on blunders and bullshit without any guilt or accountability. If they overspent, they could always find a new tax that would be hidden from public view for two months. 
The tax laws in our country were so thick that it would have been easier to understand a woman than to comprehend them. I always failed miserably at both. Most didn't know that in 1822, the federal government passed a 1% import tax to help support the First Nation people they had marginalized and written off. When I thought back to that old tax law that was never repealed, it made me wonder if they ever got anything out of it. Hey, Harold, long time no see, a man from the past said to me as I stood smoking. I see you never quit since high school. Damn right, Gus, I replied with a huge grin. For an old fart like me, you look great. Where are you headed? He asked. Back to the Cape, where I live with my wife and two kids, I replied. I was sent home because of bad weather on the rigs. You're still doing that shit, he said with a smirk. When are you going to stop being a redneck and get a real job? Like the rest of us. Working on retirement, I said. Maybe sooner than you think. I'm going to find something that will let me stay home at night. When I tell Shauna about this, she'll be surprised. You married Shauna Richards? Gus asked in complete surprise. Yes, I met her while working on the rigs in Texas when I was home on break, I said. She was in business college at the time. I'm surprised, he said. My little sister and her hung out together when they were in middle school. At that time in her life, the only guys they were interested in were African American. My sister ended up marrying one of them. He divorced her after the birth of her second child and then disappeared. It was a hard life for her for several years. She's a lawyer now and is doing great. We talked for a few more minutes and then followed each other through security. This short conversation centered on who was still around during our glory days and what they were doing now. I learned that he is married and has three children. I was finally on the last leg of my journey. I was looking forward to getting home so I could talk to my daughter. Our last conversation stayed in my head the entire trip. The cab dropped me off at the door of the house. I carried my own suitcases. My daughter hugged me tightly. I could still feel that she was overworked and was crying. After the usual greetings and my questions about how she was doing, we moved on to small details. Daddy, Sarah began. Over the past two years, I've noticed a change in mom's routine. At first, I thought it was because of the huge promotion at the Cape store at the mall. With her new responsibilities, I reminded her. Things were supposed to change at first, but after the first few months, a definite pattern began to form. By then, things should have settled down. What exactly caught your attention? At first, I didn't think anything of it, Sarah explained. Until one Friday night, my date's parents invited us to dinner at the Outback. I was sitting in the corner by the women's restroom facing the back wall when I saw my mom coming out. I got up out of curiosity and followed her. The man she was having a private romantic dinner with turned out to be Uncle Jack. It was interesting because Jasmine always worked late on Friday nights, putting together the big Sunday morning edition for printing late Saturday night, as it was the biggest and thickest newspaper of the week. Shauna always worked Fridays until 11 p.m. and Saturdays because it was the busiest time for the store. My boyfriend, who was 17 at the time, and I started going little by little on Fridays to see what we could find, Sarah continued. We discovered that Uncle Jack always left his huge truck locked behind the Macy's receiving area. Mom would drive her car to his place around 6 in the evening. When he got in Mom's car, he would get behind the wheel and she would sit next to him. Dad, she sat the same way I would sit with my boyfriend. There was no space between them. I didn't like the story Sarah was telling, but I believed she was honest in her observations. I told Hunter what we'd found out, my daughter explained. He told me to leave it in his hands while he and a few friends looked into it. While working as an apprentice at the Ford dealership, he met many people. He soon learned that Uncle Jack rented a small apartment and was there every Wednesday afternoon and Friday night with his mistress. It was he who broke the news to Aunt Jasmine. I took my daughter's hand in mine and said, I believe you, go on. Aunt Josie turned to Hunter for support and comfort while she was trying to figure out what to do, Sarah explained. I don't know who seduced who, but Hunter and Aunt Jasmine became lovers. From what Hunter told me last night, it's been going on for over a year. She's carrying Hunter's baby. 
Uncle Jack is infertile. According to our information, he had chicken pox as a child. I stood up, walked over to my wine cabinet and pulled out a bottle of sour mashed potato. From what my daughter had told me, I knew I needed a stiff drink. I pulled out a glass and poured three ounces into it, then went back and sat down across from her. How long were your mom and Uncle Jack lovers? I asked. At least 18 months as far as I know, my daughter replied. They met regularly on Fridays and Wednesdays. You're so they were already attracted to each other when I was last home, I said quietly. So what happened yesterday that caused Hunter to get shot? I asked. Mom wasn't around Uncle Jack and he came home, Sarah explained. He caught his wife and my brother in the marital bed doing the horizontal dance. In his anger, he accidentally shot Hunter while the three of them were arguing. What the hell? I said. I have to go see Hunter because I need to hear his side of the story, but not until a few days from now. Later today, you and I need to give the hospital our health insurance information, and I need to find a good divorce lawyer. When is your mom due home? Saturday morning, Sarah replied. What are you going to do? I'm going to call a cab to take me to the car rental company, I said. Then I'm going to find a hotel to stay at because I can't stay here. When I get back with the rental car, we'll do a few things. I want to hear you call mom tonight through your cell phone speaker so I can record it for my lawyer. Tears flowed freely from my daughter's eyes. She knew that her mother's behavior had left me no choice. I realized that she expected this from me. Through sobs and tears, she said, I've been waiting for this day for months. I've prayed for it to go away, but it's only gotten worse. Daddy, I want to live with you if I can. Buttercup, if that's what you really want, I'll find a way to make it happen, I said. I'm home for at least two months, and I'll have time to find a place to live and a new job. For now, it's best that your mom believes I'm not home. You're serious, aren't you? She said. Yes, but it might mean you have to change schools, I stated. I don't think I remember being hugged so tightly in my life. Sarah didn't want to move away from me, so when the cab pulled up, she came with me. Before we left, we called the school so they wouldn't contact us. Jasmine saw me get into the cab and knew I was home. She texted me saying, I need to explain things to you. I replied, I know I do. I'll get back to you when I've done a few things. My daughter is emotional, upset, and scared right now. She needs me right now. It surprised me at first that Jasmine was home, but when I figured it out, it all made sense. After what happened yesterday, she had her own emotions to deal with. I chose a small import car because I knew there was no way my wife would believe I could drive crap like that. I had been a Ford owner all my life. We left the Cape and drove to Marble Hill, where I rented a room for a week in a cheap motel. I chose that neighborhood because it was far enough away that no one would look for me there. After checking in, we went to Southeast Hospital to present our insurance cards and sign the forms. After that, we went to lunch. Hunter called his sister and they talked for a while. We found out that Jasmine was with him and that he knew I was home. I heard my daughter tell him to keep that fact to himself for now. Sarah said that tonight, we would tell his mother what was going on. After lunch, the first thing we did was go to the real estate office. I wanted to see what businesses were for sale in the neighborhood. Surprisingly, what was being offered didn't appeal to me. Nevertheless, I asked the broker to keep his eyes open. I arranged to look at a few houses on Friday. I asked the broker to focus on the ones that were ready to move in. When I got home, I called my superiors to let them know what was going on. I felt that I owed them a debt of gratitude and that they had a right to know that after more than 20 years with their organization, there was a possibility that I might have to quit. My daughter, still a minor, wanted to live with me. And the last thing I did was schedule an appointment with an attorney for Monday. Using my cell phone, I discovered that we had 50000 left on our house, and my personal savings account now held $250,000. With the house paid off, we were well on our way. With the way we had everything set up, the divorce would be simple. One of us would pay off half of the house to the other, and we would split the funds in the house account. Buttercup, I'll be back in a few minutes, I said. 
I'm going to talk to Jasmine. It's time to hear her side of the whole thing. Jasmine let me in as soon as I knocked. I could tell by the look on her face that she was stressed out. I'm so sorry, Harold, Jasmine said. You shouldn't have come home to such a mess. Would you like a drink while we talk this over? Sure, it's been a long, hard day, I said. I'm still trying to come to terms with it all. As she poured us a stiff drink, I said, Just start from the beginning, from the moment it started to affect you. I was busy working in my office when I was told Hunter needed to see me alone, Jasmine said. Knowing it was close to your anniversary, I figured he was planning a party. He told me privately that Sarah and Jack were having an affair. I didn't believe it. I accused him of lying and asked him to prove it. He took me to my husband's love nest. What we saw that day through the open window of his first floor apartment left no doubt. I was devastated. With those words, she pulled out her cell phone and displayed some pictures to show me. I could see the date they were taken. It confirmed the chronology Jasmine and my daughter had given me. Now, I could see the digital proof. Jasmine, could you please send me these pictures? I asked. I'm going to need them for my divorce petition. It may not be a big deal, but I found out early this morning that my wife only dated African-American boys during high school. Jasmine's eyes widened at such a revelation, and she said, Maybe those innocent touches over the years weren't as innocent as we thought. Could she have been stalking him for so many years? We'll never know, I said. So how did your meeting with Hunter come about? He's just like you, Harold, she said. He was there for me, just holding my hand. Gave me his moral strength and support. One night when I was in tears, he held me while we sat on the couch. I'll admit we had a little wine, but we weren't drunk at all. I lifted my head up and kissed him. He kissed me back. The intimacy we shared that night gradually developed, Jasmine admitted. About six months ago, we crossed the line. He brought me back to life again. I didn't do it out of revenge. I could agree with that. My job, distance and time away, created the same problem with my wife. We both knew it but couldn't be honest enough with each other to admit it. Even though we were married, we were strangers living in the same house. Every time I came home, we had to rebuild our relationship to bring it back into balance. Then I had to come back for at least another six months. It was one of the main reasons I was seriously considering leaving my career. Jasmine watched me, waiting for a response, and I said, Thank you for your honesty. I'll let Hunter settle this between the two of you. Hunter declared his independence a long time ago. I will support you both no matter what you decide to do. Just so you know, your timeline of events and images have been confirmed by another person. Thank you, Harold. That speaks volumes. Hunter said you would approach our relationship this way, she said with eyes full of tears. Yesterday, Jack was grossed out by the fact that he was served with divorce papers. He had already gotten a court order to stay away. It was at this point that the shooting made sense. Jack always lost his temper when things didn't go according to his plan and always reacted without thinking. He came home to put Jasmine in her place, finding her in bed with Hunter. He came in furious because Hunter stood up to Jasmine just as I would have done. I knew Jack had a gun because he took it for protection, since his job required him to be in rough neighborhoods. Jasmine. For reasons I can't explain, for the next few days you have to believe I'm out of town, I said. That's why I rented a car. Sarah has already made it clear she wants to live with me. I left, having gotten what I came for. I heard her truth and got proof that Jack and my wife's affair had started before my son got involved. When I got home, I sat down at the table and told my daughter everything I had been told. Dad, this makes a lot of sense. Everyone knows Hunter is very mature for his age, Sarah remarked. That's lent credibility by the pictures you have and the fact that Hunter has fully opened up to me. From the moment he got his first car, I said. He's always been with an older woman if he's dated. I think that's my fault, too. When I wasn't around a lot, he stepped up and became the de facto man of the house. I wasn't much older than him when he was born, I said. I realized that no matter how I felt, my son was going to do what he was going to do. 
Whether I like it or not, it's their life, and we have to let them live it. Dad, don't you think it's time for me to call Mom and let her know what's going on? My daughter asked. First, go to the Play Store and see if you can find an app that lets you record your own conversations, I said. Sarah started looking. It was frustrating because after downloading it, we had to test it. Most of the ones she tried were misleading with their hype. Finally, we found one that performed the function we wanted. I made sure I downloaded the same one. It took three rings before Shauna answered. Sarah had already turned on the speakerphone function. Mom, I need a note for missing school today, Sarah said. Why did you miss school? Are you sick? Shauna asked. No, I was at the hospital most of last night with Hunter, explained Sarah. So when I got home, I was too exhausted to go to school. What happened to Hunter? Shauna asked, expressing genuine concern. He took a bullet in the shoulder, fired from a gun at close range, stated Sarah. What? Are you serious? How is he? Will he keep his shoulder? Asked Shauna with concern in her voice. How did that happen? Don't leave anything out. It happened because you weren't where you usually are on Wednesday afternoons, Mom, Sarah said firmly. What the hell does that mean? We both know I'm supposed to be at work. Are you implying that Hunter got shot at the store? Shauna said, knowing it was a lie. No, Mom. It means you weren't at 644 Morgan Avenue, apartment 4, with Uncle Jack, said Sarah. And this was interesting because Shauna's silence was deafening. Gathering her thoughts, she asked, How long have you two known each other? Pretty much since the beginning. I found out about Uncle Jack and you by accident when you had dinner with him Friday night, Shauna said. It was weeks before I found out where Uncle Jack parked his tool truck to wait for you to pick him up. When I told my brother, he said he'd follow up on it, and he did, Sarah continued. He was the one who discovered Uncle Jack in your love nest. He brought Jasmine there, and they were able to catch pictures of him eating you. They're actually quite graphic. A sob came from Shauna's lips. Then she said, I'm flying home Saturday morning. You and I are going to have to sit down and work this situation out before your father gets home. Mom, that's not all. Last Wednesday, Uncle Jack, expecting you, served you in your love nest. I suppose because of the short notice of your trip to New York, you failed to put him on notice, Sarah said. He came home furious to put his wife Jasmine in her place and make it clear that there would be no divorce. Jack made it clear that he was going to continue to sleep with his whore and stay married. He didn't know that because of Uncle Jack and your behavior, the two of you pushed Jasmine and Hunter together. And I, I gave a thumbs up to show that I agreed with what she said. Sarah smiled widely because she realized that what she said really explained everything. Uncle Jack, in defiance of a court order, came to his former home and found Jasmine and Hunter together, she explained. In anger, he grabbed a gun and destroyed it. My question is what should I tell my father when I call him? How and where are Hunter and Uncle Jack now? Shauna asked. Uncle Jack is in jail, charged with attempted murder, said Sarah. Hunter should make a full recovery, but he will have to do some serious rehab. So, Mom, what am I going to tell Dad? Or do you want him to get all the details from the online newspaper tomorrow morning? Give me a few minutes to gather my thoughts and I'll call him myself, she said. It's best if I handle the situation with him on my end. Okay, Mom, Sarah said. Congratulations. You're going to be a grandmother. Jasmine is three months pregnant, and according to Hunter, this is his baby. We also know that Jasmine will be catering to you once you get home. Shanna lost her temper. I didn't care because I felt that after what she had done, payback for her behavior was justified. Sarah waited for a response and, not hearing one, ended the conversation. After finishing the conversation, I stood up and poured two sour cocktails. In one, I added ice and Coke. I didn't add any to mine. Putting it in front of her, I said, I'm going to have an adult drink with my daughter because she handled herself better than most adults would. I'm very proud of you, Buttercup. We both waited for the phone call. We had already had our first adult beverage together, and I was preparing a second drink for each of us when my cell phone rang. I sent it to the answering machine. When I sat down at the table with our drinks, I turned on the speaker and dialed the service number. 
It was funny because Shauna had said only one thing. Call me when you have a minute. Uncle Jack accidentally destroyed Hunter, and we need to talk about it. Dad, before you answer that, let's see what the online newspaper says about it, Sarah said. She got up and brought out her laptop. When we got in, we found out that the whole story had made the front page. The reporter had everything. The headline read, Husband Shot Wife's Lover. It explained everything in detail. The relationship between the four of them became the property of the world. It was amazing how the whole convoluted story was explained. What shocked us the most was when we learned that Jack Parsons with the breaking news on the newspaper's website was not his real name. He has been using a stolen name for years. His real name is Raymond John Smith, who had a criminal record for petty theft. When he was fingerprinted, his real name came out. The real shocker was when a warrant was issued for his arrest for possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. There was something about that name that was memorable to me. I thought about it for a few minutes, and only then did it come to my mind. The first thing I did was dial the phone number for the police department and told the officer on duty about his big tool truck and the neighborhood it covered. I suggested he get a search warrant and check it out. When he asked why, I said because no one I knew had ever seen him sell anything out of that truck. I went to Facebook and typed Gus Charles's name into the search. After going through a bunch of profiles, I finally found his face. After reading his profile, I called the help desk and got his phone number. I called it, and a woman answered. It was his wife. Madam, I'm an old high school buddy of your husband's, I said. I ran into him at the St. Louis airport this morning and had a long chat. The reason for my call is that I need the name of his younger sister, Ashley's ex-husband, who has disappeared. His name is Raymond John Smith, Gus's wife said. He owes 16 years worth of child support. You might want to let her know that he's sitting in Cape Girardeau Prison, Missouri. He used a false name, and his name was Jack Parsons. Are you serious? She asked. Yes, seriously, and do me a favor, I said. Let Ashley know that he also had an affair with my wife, whose maiden name is Shauna Richards. My God, Ashley is still talking about the wild things they did back then, she said. This is going to hit her hard. Can I give your number to Ashley? Please give it, I said. My soon-to-be ex-wife is coming home on Saturday. Sarah was shocked. To be honest, so was I. I texted Jasmine and asked if she was home so she could come over right away. Dad, Mom knew who he was the first time we met him, Sarah said. What other lies are we going to find out about? I don't know, but it's starting to look like they were reliving their glory days, I said. I wonder what else they do. We took a few minutes to digest all the information we had just learned. In a way, it was crazy because the more my daughter and I learned, the more questions came up. When we heard a knock, Sarah went to open the door. I got up and made Jasmine some sour mashed potatoes and Coke. I handed her the Coke as she walked into the kitchen. The first thing we did was show her the updated article on the internet. It was a revelation to her. Sarah had remembered to send me a message about the conversation between my wife and her, and I reproduced it so Jasmine would know what it was about. There's a good chance that your and Jack's marriage won't be legal at all, I said. You'd better get your divorce lawyer to look into it. I was at the hospital most of the day, Jasmine said. I was just getting home when I got your message. There's no way he can bail out. It's worse than that, I said. He has two kids, a daughter and a son, all grown up now. His ex-wife was Shauna's best friend in high school. The look of shock on Jasmine's face my daughter and I will remember for the rest of our lives. They knew about it from the first day we met him, Jasmine said, crying. If he had children, why didn't I get pregnant before this? He probably had a vasectomy before he met you, I said. That's the only thing that makes sense. I was quiet for a bit while both ladies discussed what they knew so far. I tried to figure out what else was going on. My intuition was telling me that there was more to this story than we knew. Ladies, I think we should all go through all the stuff in our homes, I said. 
There is something missing from this puzzle, and I wonder if Shauna was helping Jack with whatever else he was doing. I have to wonder if he might have been hiding something. If so, whether Shauna was involved. That doesn't sound very convincing, Jasmine said. I know he drove his truck daily and left for the night. Okay, Jasmine, that sounds fair, I said. Shauna kept his secrets, why? You must have seen the records of his orders and gotten a lot of invoices for the stock he bought? Jack always said it was run by a corporation and they had to pay for the stock and equipment, Jasmine said. Then he must have gotten monthly statements via email or direct mail, I said. Have you seen any of them? Did you ever see him wire money to them? No, but I know Jack's Outlook account. We can go look, she said. We went to her house, opened the home computer, and logging in, opened the Windows mail. Sure enough, there was nothing there. Can I have some? I asked. In the search box in the bottom corner, I typed hot. The Outlook symbol appeared. I clicked on it, and what wasn't originally visible in the Windows mail appeared in the browser. Jack had four unknown email accounts linked to one. It became clear to us all that he was hiding something. Jasmine, first thing in the morning, call the police station and give them the information about Jack's email access, I said. I'm going to go home and go through the whole house to see if I can find any money. I want to make sure our house hasn't been used for anything. I'll do the same thing. What will I do if I find anything? Jasmine asked. Call me. I'll come over and we'll discuss what to do. I'm going to comb our house with extra care, I said. Obviously, we need to protect our asses. Dad, do you really think Mom is going to let Jack store stuff in our house? Sarah asked. Based on their relationship, I can't assume she won't allow it anymore, I said. First, look in the places you don't normally go in unless it's for something quiet. Sarah and I headed home. I got the flashlight out and made sure it was working. I'm going into the garage to get to the attic, I explained. No one's supposed to be up there since we pumped extra insulation in there. I had to push back the rental, set up a ladder, climb up, and undo the latch. Using a high-density flashlight, I looked around the room and found nothing. I turned around on the ladder to look behind me as I reached up to grab onto something to support myself. At that moment, I felt something. I climbed down, turned the ladder around, and climbed back up. There were five huge garbage bags in a row, the kind I took out to the driveway once a week. When Sarah heard the first bag hit the floor, she came running. Get it out of the way, I asked. I have four more bags like that. When the second bag hit the floor, it split open. Wads of $20 bills fell out of it. When all five bills were on the garage floor, I noticed another flat bag lying off to the side. I picked it up and started downstairs, remembering to close the entrance to the attic. Sarah, run down to Jasmine and tell her what we found while I check these bags, I asked. It took about five minutes for them to return. All five bags were a quarter full of wads of money. The sixth bag held Jack's ledger. Harold, can you come over to my place and check on the apartment? Jasmine asked. Right after I called the police, I replied. Sarah. I called the police and they said they would send a patrol car. Jasmine, Sarah, and I went to her place, bringing Jack's ledger with us. After looking through her attic, I found a small chest of illegal substances. I put the ledger with it. I called the police again and asked them to send a detective with a patrol car. It took over three hours before the police took possession of the money. We had to explain everything from the time of the shooting until today. When the detective left, he said they would take my wife into custody for questioning when she returned to the Cape on Saturday. We can't link the money to anything right now, the detective said. They will be counted, recorded, and locked up. We'll record them as voluntarily surrendered by your Mr. Phillips as found money. Thank you, officer, I said. What about the illegal substances we found in my neighbor's house? Because Jack Parson lived there, he said. And his wife turned in the banned substances with your help. She won't be charged, but he will be. Will you be back tomorrow with a search warrant for either of us? Jasmine asked. Detective, you better make a note of my husband's email account and his password. Go to Outlook directly through your browser. I don't think that's necessary, said the detective. If you find a small amount of illegal substances, flush them down the toilet and dispose of them. 
I'm guessing most of what Jack has is in this truck, which is being towed to the impound lot right now until we get a court order authorizing a search. Thanks for the info on his email account. I will request a court order to search it. We watched the police drive away and I said, I don't know about you, but I need a good stiff drink. Jasmine went into the house and started guarding it and then joined us. Are you going to let your mom know what's going on? Sarah asked. I think if we do, she'll know the money is there, I said. It's best to leave what we know in the hands of the detective. Tomorrow, while you're at school, I'll finish going through both houses to make sure there's nothing else in there. Thank you, Harold. I would really appreciate it, Jasmine said. Jasmine, I need you to follow me to the car rental company tomorrow, I said. Things have changed. There's no way I'm leaving my daughter alone. Can I sleep here tonight? Jasmine asked. Sure, you can sleep in the room that used to be Hunter's room, I said. In the middle of the night, the three of us were awakened by the sounds of police sirens. The police had set up an unmarked car to keep an eye on our houses. They had caught a man trying to break into Jasmine's house. Around five in the morning our time, I called my wife. I was sitting on the terrace drinking my first coffee and having a cigarette. She answered immediately. Harold, we're in a bloody mess at home. Jack accidentally destroyed Hunter, Shauna said. Fortunately, he's going to make a full recovery. The police are holding Jack pending the outcome of the investigation. Have you talked to Jasmine to see what she knows? I asked. No, Sarah and I spend most of our time at the hospital, she replied. I'll talk to her in her office today and give you her version of events. Any word on when you'll be coming home? We'd all like to see you. Right now we're monitoring the weather and packing everything up, I said. If evacuation orders come in, I may be home sooner than you think. It took her a few seconds to respond. Are you serious? I replied, check the weather reports. We have a hurricane coming in. We could get evacuation orders in a few hours. If that happens, I'm going home. Promise me you'll call me so I can make sure everything is ready for you at home if that happens, Shauna asked. Okay, I said. I'll talk to you later. Bye. From that brief conversation, I realized that she couldn't admit the truth and never would. It also told me that any feelings she had left for me were completely dead. I could now proceed with the divorce without any remorse. After taking Sarah to school, Jasmine followed me in my truck so I could return the rental car. Then we returned the hotel keys and picked up my luggage. I suggested that until I got home, she visit Hunter and get a key to his apartment to live there temporarily. The real estate broker and I looked at four houses, all of which were owned, and I said let's go to the new construction. The first house we looked at had two acres of land in a new neighborhood. If I bought it, Sarah wouldn't have to change schools. It had everything I needed with an unfinished basement. I put together a cash offer with a large down payment right on the spot, below the asking price, and demanded a five-year warranty on the new house in exchange for closing within four days. The real estate broker thought I was being too aggressive. Leaving her, I went out and bought a new set of door locks. After returning home, I texted Jasmine and Sarah to let them know where I was. After that, I started searching the rest of the house. I found a stack of bearer bonds from a local bank in the amount of $10,000 each, payable on demand. Same. I turned on the news and learned that the local police told the TV station that they had searched both of our homes and had found many items seized that could be linked to the man responsible for the shooting. It was also noted that new charges were being prepared. I assumed they made this announcement to take the pressure off of us. After changing all the locks and resetting all the security codes, I continued my search. I found some very nice expensive jewelry that I didn't even realize my wife had. After finally clearing out the house, I went back to the attic to take another look through the attic with a heavy-duty semi-industrial flashlight. That's when I discovered the additional bags of money. They were lined up in a row in the farthest corner, hidden by darkness. They, too, were filled with cash. Using the card I had been given, I called the detective again and let him know what I had found. Until they arrived, I took a few wads of cash out of each bag and left them in the attic for myself.
I was beginning to believe that Jack had been selling for years, making a nice profit for it. The detective carried 20 bags out of the house, shaking his head as he did so. I think he, like me, had a hard time believing what I'd discovered. Then I realized that if I had left the ledger with the money, everything would have been tied up. Officer, we've been their neighbors for 20 years. Could he have been selling illegal stuff all those years? I asked. Considering he's been living under an assumed name for longer than that, I'd say it's more than possible, he explained. There are plenty of examples of women who lived with serial killers for years and knew nothing. Why should it be any different? I'd really like to ask your wife about her relationship with him and how long it lasted. Then you should know that late last night I found out that Jack, as we call him, was the husband of my wife's high school best friend before he married Jasmine, I explained. His ex-wife Ashley may be flying in this Saturday to see for herself what she's been told. He looked at me with a smile, and as soon as Jasmine pulled into her driveway, he said, This is getting interesting. Does his current wife know? Yes, and I'm going to go and completely search her house, I said. After the attempted break-in yesterday, we decided it was for the best. I'll be ready to be called again, the detective said with a smile. I'll be interviewing Jack for the second time today. There was a raised floor in the truck that was filled with cocaine. He's gone for good. Jasmine walked over to him and said, Officer, it's good to see you again. You should get a call from my attorney about my husband's identity. He wants to use it to get my marriage annulled right away. Jasmine watched the detective leave. Following his advice, we surveyed her house. If we found anything, we flushed it. Better to be safe than sorry. Jasmine began packing up her belongings, which she had moved to my son's apartment for safety reasons. Just like in my apartment, we found bearer bonds that she had packed to take with her. When we were done, she was pleased to find that we had found so little. I told her that I had made an offer on a newly built house. I said I was going to use bearer bonds to partially pay for it if my offer was accepted. She asked who I had used as an agent, and I told her. Do you think Shauna worked with him? Jasmine asked. Or did he trick her like he did us? That's unknown because we've had keys to each other's houses for years, I said. He could come in when we weren't home and hide things at any time. What surprised me was that he wasn't smart enough to make many of his savings legitimate. My daughter and I went to Hunter's house together. He recounted the whole story. I learned that it all started around the time I was supposed to go home for the last time, but missed that time because I was on another drill. Hunter was slowly getting better. He didn't know if he and Jasmine would get married, so they decided to live together to see what would happen with the age difference. Can't argue with that logic, son, I said. She sounds mature and well thought out. Thanks, Dad, Hunter said. I appreciate everything you do for Jasmine. Now that I see it from your side, I don't know how you deal with it. Son, I may not like what your mother did, I said. But I wasn't there for her because of my chosen field of endeavor. Loneliness led your mother elsewhere. If I ever have a relationship with the opposite sex again, my lifestyle will have to change. Sarah looked at me and said, You have no anger or hatred in you, and you don't blame her for what she did. I want to kill her. Look, my job came first, and I left raising you both to her, I said. When you grew up and became independent, she didn't have anyone left to give her the attention and love she obviously needed. I'm sad about what she did, but I can't hate her for it, and I don't judge her for it, even if it ruined our marriage. Besides, she could still have a lot of problems. Like what, for instance? Hunter asked. If the police can connect her to what your Uncle Jack was doing, I said, she'll spend a lot of time behind bars, too. It never ceases to amaze me that so many people can't see what's right in front of them. The truth I told both of my children made them speechless. Around 9 o'clock Saturday morning, I received word that my offer to sell the house had been accepted. A half hour later, I was already sitting in the broker's office giving her money for a huge deposit using some bearer bonds I found when I received a text message that said, Can we meet? I'm Gus Ashley's sister. I replied, Where are you? She replied, At the airport. 
I replied, I would be there in 15 minutes. You got an exceptionally good price for your new home, the broker said. I was surprised he agreed to it. That's why I asked you if he'd sold any of these houses yet, I said. There's nothing like a sold sign to get others interested. With that, I headed to the airport. As soon as I walked through the door, I saw her. I knew it had to be her because the small airport was empty as the plane had just taken off, heading back to St. Louis with the passengers it had just picked up. Ashley was a very pleasant-looking woman. Her brown hair was styled in a way that emphasized the softness of her face. She had an attractive figure that didn't need to be emphasized by wearing clothes that hid some of her facial features. A feminine outfit of blue jeans showed off her no-frills class. My first impression of her was that she was a woman who was comfortable just being. She approached me and said, You really haven't changed much from the pictures Gus uploaded and sent me. Nice to meet you, Mr. Phillips. Call me Harold, please, I said, extending my hand to her. We walked into the airport restaurant and sat down at a table. I offered to buy her an early lunch, and she agreed. For the first while, we just sat and talked, getting to know each other. She noticed that I wasn't wearing a ring. I told her I never wore it when I was on the rigs, and after learning from my daughter about my wife's infidelity, I saw no reason to wear it again. I learned that after the divorce, she had reverted to her maiden name. We were just having lunch when the last morning plane arrived from St. Louis. Ashley and I sat by the window, which allowed us to watch the unloading passengers go through the gate. It also gave us an unrestricted view of the open area of the small airport. The waitress was just filling our cups of coffee when I spotted Shauna walking through the gate. I raised my hand and waved. Ashley turned around to see who I was waving to. Shauna saw the two of us. She just froze in shock, her face turning white. I knew she hadn't read the local paper online, so she had no idea what was really going on. As she adjusted to her new reality, we watched as the detective approached her and introduced himself, showing his badge. We watched him accompany her to pick up her luggage. She had no idea you were in town, did she? asked Ashley. No. We deliberately hid that fact from her, I said. Everything she planned to do to resolve this issue was thrown out the window. Now she's going to find out about the cash and ledger that was found in Jasmine's house and my house. May I have the privilege of handling your divorce case? Ashley asked. It would be fun to straighten her out. The fact that my ex and her are together has raised a lot of questions about everything we did together back in the day. And the office will let you fly back and forth while you handle the case? I asked. I have my own divorce firm out of my house, Ashley said. Besides, I'll be here dealing with my ex anyway. I must have smiled because she said, I guess we agreed. If you have a printer, we can write everything up today. Matt, we took her luggage and put it in the back of my truck. I told her that her ex-husband was in the county jail in Jackson. She said she would like to talk to him, so I drove her there and waited for her to go inside. It was about an hour before she came out. He was shocked to see me, Ashley says. He asked how I found him, and I said thanks to you. I then told him that the police had searched his house and taken all the money they found. I told him that they had found the book that Sarah kept. His face turned white. I looked at her and smiled even wider than before. Grabbing my cell phone, I called the detective. He answered on the first ring. I told him what and how I was able to find out. He informed me that he would do a comparative handwriting analysis to see if she was involved with illegal substances, but not cash, because the ledger had a list of their contacts, who they supplied and bought from. So my soon-to-be ex may have been in the loop all along, I said. That will make the divorce easier. She'll need her share to pay the legal bills. Yes, that's right. We'll be charging her later today as an accessory, the detective said. That means she won't make bail until Monday. With that, we headed to my house to start drafting the divorce petition. On the way, I explained how our finances had been arranged for most of our married life. Smart move on your part, Ashley said. By having separate savings accounts, we'll be able to argue that they weren't contributed to the marriage. We sat down at the table as soon as we got home, 
and she started working on the divorce petition while I made coffee. I emailed her the images Jasmine had provided me. I told her I didn't want to take the house because of what had happened. Ashley asked if Shauna had enough money to buy me out. I replied that based on the way we divided the household funds, she should have enough. It took about two more hours to get to the point where we were ready to print. After letting her know the access code, I went and turned on the printer. Just as we were sorting through the copies and preparing them for filing in the district court on Monday, my daughter returned from an outing with her friends. There was an immediate attraction between them. After introductions were made, I explained to my daughter who she was. Sarah, meet Ashley Lynn Charles, I said. Her family still lives in the village of Dutchtown. Ashley is my daughter, Sarah, I said. She'll be moving into my new house with me next week, as soon as we buy the furniture. Sarah's eyes grew huge with excitement, and she jumped into my arms, hugged me tightly, and asked, What did you buy? A newly built three-bedroom house with an open floor plan, a two-bay garage, an unfinished basement, and an elevated terrace. There's only one problem. What is it, Dad? Sarah asked. It's not landscaped, I said. So I'll be looking at the price of the pool after closing on Monday. Her eyes lit up. Sarah had wanted a pool for a long time. The reason I hadn't was because I didn't want to mess with the landscaping we'd already done. Since it was getting close to dinner time, I asked them where they wanted to go. They both chose Ruby Tuesday's restaurant because of the huge salad bar. After dinner, we took her to the car rental company so she could get a car. Sarah asked Ashley if she wanted to come with us on Sunday to look at furniture. Ashley replied that she would love to. So we did. On Monday, I sat in the courtroom and watched the judge file charges against the man known to me as Jack Parsons and my wife. Jack was denied bail. Bail for my wife was set at $500,000, which meant she had to post 10%. Ashley went over and filed papers on my behalf and then sued my ex-husband for alimony. When Ashley came back to me, she took my hand in hers. I knew Jack and Shauna must have noticed this. We walked out together, leaving them alone with their thoughts. Earlier that day, I had handed over the rest of the bearer bonds needed to finalize the purchase of the house. Ashley filed the divorce papers and paid the legal fees. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I went to finalize the purchase of my new home. I had just walked out of the land title office with the executed transfer and the interest from the bearer bonds in the form of a check in hand when Ashley called. She found the letter on the rental car that was parked at her parents' house. It was a demand letter. They were holding my daughter Sarah and demanding everything I had, but wouldn't turn it over to the cops. My response should have come in the same form they sent it. I had Ashley say I would meet them at the Trail of Tears State Park at midnight tonight. I gave the geologic code of the place I wanted to meet them. Walking home, I did some thinking. I took some small propane containers and attached one of them to a handheld welder. After putting it in my truck, I pulled out an old tent I hadn't used in years and threw it in there along with the crossbow. It wasn't long before I had the tent set up. I stayed there for the night. Taking a gym bag with the necessary tools, I headed out into the darkness. The spot I had chosen was along the mighty Mississippi on the edge of a bluff. Years ago, the state had railed it making it a vantage point to view the river. From this spot, once you stepped off the edge, you could walk straight down to the river. I tied a gym bag filled with paper to the railing and hung it over the edge. To reach the bag, you had to lean on the railing. It took me three hours to cut the bolts, so there was nothing left to hold the railing in place. I was lucky because it started to rain. I hid, watching the trail, and saw one person coming this way. Using my night vision goggles, I discerned a detailed image of the man's face. He and his brothers lived near Dutchtown and were friends of Jack Parsons. I had to ask myself if he was part of the group. I waited a half hour after the appointed time to make sure he wasn't being followed. The landing was illuminated by the brightness of the full moon. The rain had let up, leaving the ground damp. Then I stepped out into the clearing behind him. 
There you go, Earl, I said, turning on the high-intensity light aimed at the rope. What you need is attached to the railing. It will be yours as soon as your brothers take my daughter to my lawyer. As soon as my lawyer calls me, I'll put the crossbow down and walk away, I said. If I don't agree, Earl said, that I'll put an arrow through your throat and go after the rest of your brothers tonight, I said. Earl couldn't afford to call my bluff. He pulled out his cell phone and made a call. It was funny to stand there and watch him sweat. He could clearly see that my crossbow had three arrows in it. Jack has decided you've gone quiet, Earl said. He's planning an escape, and he needed bearer bonds to get him and your wife out of town. Right. Looks like you and your brothers are in the ledger, I said. How do you know about the ledger? Earl asked. I gave it to the cops, I said. I guess it's only a matter of time before you all go down. If my daughter comes back safe and sound, you might want to think about using what's in the bag to disappear. Earl began to panic. Like all fools, ignorance was bugging him. He asked if he could make another call. I nodded my head in agreement. I listened as he said, Drop the girl off and run. The cops have what we wanted the ledger. If the girl is touched, we're all screwed. The only question is when. Another ten minutes passed before my phone rang. It was Ashley calling to confirm that Sarah had shown up and wasn't hurt. I turned off the lights and disappeared into the darkness. Earl leaned on the railing to pick up his bag. Nothing was holding it up, and the weight of his body pushed the bag down. With that done, I went back to the tent and went to bed. It took them two weeks to find Earl's body. Jack Parsons didn't take the news very well. I arrived at Ashley's parents' house early Tuesday morning. My daughter ran out to greet me. I was invited to a lavish breakfast and learned a few things. The sheriff of our county is retiring. Gus and Ashley's father, I learned, was a big shot in the local Democratic Party. At breakfast, I told him I should run for the position. He asked if I was willing to take the state courses to qualify for the position. I answered in the affirmative. Then I think you have already officially started your candidacy for this office, he said. The pride in my daughter's eyes spoke volumes as she said, One thing I have learned about my father is that if he puts his mind to something, it is sure to get done. I handed my daughter my cell phone and told her to listen to the conversation I had recorded with her mother last Friday morning. It was interesting to watch the four of them as they listened to it. My daughter said, Mom was never going to be honest with you, was she? I replied, No, I was beginning to wonder if she was the one who pulled Jack back into the drug business, using the money I earned to do it. This revelation of mine surprised them all. To be honest, it surprised me too. Just so we're all on the same page, I think what's happened since Ashley found the note should be kept to ourselves, I said. Because it didn't turn out the way Jack and Shauna wanted it to. With those words, they watched as I called the detective and informed him that Jack Parsons was going to make an escape attempt in the next couple days. If it was successful, I told him, the two lovers would elope. The detective seriously said that I should have become a policeman myself, because with my ability to recognize everything, I would be a good policeman. We were on our way back to the Cape when my cell phone rang. It was my ex, Shauna. I'll be out on bail in two hours, she said. I was wondering if I could access the house. Ashley and Sarah looked at me, wondering what my answer would be. You can have the house to yourself late tonight, I said. My lawyer will drive your car up to the love nest and hand you the keys to it and the new keys to the house. Sarah and I had to move most of what we need out of the house. We'll pick up the rest when you're at work this week. I hung up the phone and said, Ashley, if you don't mind, most of the new furniture is being delivered today and they were paid to put it up. Do you mind keeping an eye on where everything is supposed to be placed? I'd love to, she replied. If I remember, the appliance dealer will be there by 10, and the three furniture companies will be there sometime after that. Sarah and I dropped Ashley off first. They were both seeing the new house for the first time. They liked the open floor plan and the size. Sarah had her pick of which bedroom would be hers. She liked that her bedroom had its own bathroom and walk-in closet. Daddy, should we get the pots and everything we need from the house? She asked. 
I thought for a second and replied, No, let's start over as soon as we pack up all of our personal belongings and bring them here. I'll take care of that, and Ashley and you can go shopping for what the house needs. Fortunately, most of the windows have built-in blinds, Ashley remarked. That will give you privacy until you buy curtains. Sarah and I were already leaving. Ashley and I were already saying our goodbyes when my son yelled, Daddy! Nyada! Jasmine and him had just come out of the house across the street. They walked over and I introduced them to each other. It was interesting to watch Jasmine and Ashley look closely at each other. If you ignored the color of their skin, it was obvious that they were very similar in build. Now I understood why I was so interested in Ashley. Before I went back to the house and packed my things, I went to the branch and opened a new checking account, transferring funds from my savings. I got both new debit cards, one for Sarah and one for me. I also paid off my credit card balance and transferred my company paycheck to it. The closet boxes I purchased made the packing and moving process easier. It only took a couple hours to load them. At the bottom of one of the boxes, I placed the bearer bonds I had been storing. I took a few minutes to go to the attic and gather up the 50 packs of $50 bills I had stored. Sarah had to get her laptop, and I reminded her to change all her passwords just in case. After I unloaded the closet boxes, the ladies hit the road. I spent time removing the boxes that contained our furniture and gathering them into a burning pile in the dirt in the front yard. I called ATT to get the internet hooked up. The ladies returned with a truck loaded with stuff just as the delivery drivers were leaving. The master bedroom was set up, as was Sarah's bedroom. The living room and family room had been tidied up. A wooden table and chairs stood in the open space inside the kitchen, which even had a counter to sit at and eat at if one wanted to. Each room had everything we needed to set up our new home. All we needed was internet and for the TV to work. If needed, we could always watch Pluto TV from our laptop if the neighborhood had free Wi-Fi. After unloading the truck, which was full of everything but the kitchen sink, Ashley and I headed over to my old house, picked up Shauna's car, and drove to her place. I watched Ashley go into the house and waited about an hour before she came out. When Ashley got into the car, I asked her, Did you get the answers you were looking for? Not really, Ash replied. They didn't have a relationship when my husband and I were together. They started afterward. I found out that she was planning on divorcing you as soon as Sarah graduated from high school. They were lovers for about six years, Ashley continued. Raymond was selling the whole time you knew him. Shauna claims she had no idea she was in your house, but I don't believe her. I recorded the entire conversation thanks to Sarah synchronizing her phone with mine. Rah! Do you think we should send the file to the detective? I asked, getting behind the wheel. Yeah, I think we should, Ashley replied with a giggle. Did I understand you correctly that you want to see where our relationship could go? Sa I thought we'd already started working on that, I said. Even your parents saw that we were attractive. Ashley pulled herself closer to me and said, Sarah suggested KFC or fish and chips for dinner. We grabbed KFC before heading to the new place. Sarah had been very busy while we were gone. She had already washed one set of linens and put the other set in the washer to make our beds. Most of the groceries were put away, and the dishwasher was run to quickly rinse and dry our dishes for sanitizing. I was pleasantly surprised that they brought two bottles of sour mashed potato and some cola. So we each had a drink when we first ate at the table. After dinner, I went up to the bedroom and laid out my stuff. After unpacking all the boxes, I turned to my suitcase that I had brought with me. I pulled a shaving brush and a shaving cup out of the suitcase and remembered how my grandfather had given me that old cup. To buy a decent brush, you had to order it online. His grandfather gave it to him, and I would have passed it on to mine had I been alive. The ladies came over to make the double bed and put towels in the bedroom along with rugs and a small trash container. They even bought an alarm clock radio for my nightstand. The little light bulbs matched the bedding perfectly. I laughed because they put two narrow rugs on each side of the bed. Sarah, knowing my taste, had even bought me shower soap and body shampoo. I tore down the boxes and took them to the burn pile. I saw that the ladies had a few more empty boxes, 
and put those away too. The kitchen was all set up. I had to pour through all the cabinets to see the furnishings. The new coffee pot and toaster were on the table. The new microwave stood in its place. I was pleased with the way things were shaping up. The ladies ran downstairs to get things for Sarah's room, bringing with them a few bags I hadn't seen before. It was another hour or so before everything was ready. It was a nice evening. I went out with a lighter and lit the burning pile. It was interesting to watch the flames rise into the night sky. I was so deep in thought that I almost missed the call on my cell phone. It was my soon-to-be ex. It's gone, she said, from both places. Where is it? Better call a detective and ask him, I said, laughing. You knew, she said. So how did you get Sarah back? Better ask Earl or his brothers about that if you can find them, I said. The silence on the other end said it all. I ended the call and put the phone back in my pocket. The phone rang. It was my son, Hunter. Dad, we bought the house across the street. Mom called and wants to talk. Just so you know, I told her where to go and how to do it. She wasn't impressed, so expect her to blame you for that too. We talked for a few more minutes. He had a few questions about the future of Jasmine and Ashley's relationship. I said that we needed to emphasize that they were both used by him and let them work it out between themselves. After taking a smoke break, I decided that the fire had gotten hot enough for me to leave since most of the cardboard had burned. I walked back to my new home and heard the washing machine running. Sarah came over to me and said goodnight. I'll lock the door when I go to take Ashley home, I said. Nah. You should have seen the look on my daughter's face because it left me completely bewildered. Ashley came down the stairs in her new nightgown and house robe. That's when I said I'd better go shave and shower. It was her clothes that were in the washing machine. Now I knew why my daughter had that look. I was awakened by a knock on the door. My daughter needed to be taken to school. I got dressed and met her at the front door. Sarah smiled broadly. Daddy, you haven't looked this happy in a long time, she said. I'm happy for you. I dropped her off, telling her I'd be back to pick her up. It was nice to get home and relax. For the first time since I left the rig, I had nothing to do but cuddle with Ashley, which, believe me, I did quite a bit of. At showed up around lunchtime and set up the internet. Ashley's father and mother showed up around one o'clock with Ashley's rental car and clothes. Shortly after that, a photographer came in to take my professional pictures for the sign. George Charles decided that by the end of the week, they would collect signatures to register my candidacy. I gave him 5,000 in cash for my campaign. Ashley took her mom on a tour of the new house. Glenda liked what Ashley had started to do with it to make it her own. I realized from their conversation that she was already applying her style when she helped us pick out furniture. George, I asked, did I have any chance at all? To be honest, when she came home Saturday night, he said, I was in complete shock when she told me I'd met the man I was going to spend the rest of my life with. When Monday came around, everything fell apart, he continued. After looking up the coordinates on Google Maps, she said Daddy Harold was taking advantage of whoever was holding Sarah. Around 1 a.m., she showed up safe and sound. Sarah explained she didn't know what had happened, but those holding her were very scared and quickly backed off after the second phone call. He continued. She realized from the way they were communicating that they were related. It was Ed Racine and his brothers, I said. Back in high school, they were known as homesteaders. When he found himself in front of a loaded crossbow with three arrows less than 10 feet away, his behavior changed. I gave him one chance, free himself or die. He thought about it for a while. Then, to put pressure on him, I said, call your brothers and tell them I'm coming. I can honestly say he was still alive when I left him. What about now? George asked. Time will tell, I replied. Who knows what the future will bring? A smile appeared on Ashley's father's face as he said, Welcome to the family of your old schoolmate, Harold. I will be proud to have a grandchild from you. From that statement, I knew everything I needed to know about the man who sat at the table across from me.
he was as old school as I was. Each of us was like the James brothers who had become bigger than we were in life. In our lives, we did what was necessary. We were as tough as the red dirt of Missouri. It had been six months since I came home. We were all watching the local channel broadcast the results. My parents, Ashley's parents, Jasmine and Hunter, who had just gotten married, took turns holding my newborn grandson and the three of us. Shauna and the man we knew as Jack were sentenced to life in prison without parole. My divorce was finalized. My former employer, using the stock I owned and the company's pension fund, had secured my full retirement early. I would die and they would still owe money to my inheritance. George was thrilled because I was quite comfortably in the lead. Three days earlier, the police department had returned the money they had found to me. Accompanied by them, I had deposited over six million in the bank. Sarah had gotten her pool, Ashley now had four employees working in the basement of our house, and her new place was becoming quite successful. I walked over and knelt in front of Ashley before we joined our supporters at the election celebration and said, Will you marry me? When she said yes, I slipped the ring on her finger. At that same moment, the news announced that I was the winner. George was as proud as a peacock in full bloom, not only because we were officially engaged, but because there was a new sheriff in town. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.